Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, and this webinar is also co-hosted uh, co -hosted by openchannels.org. Um, and I'd like to welcome to you here today. Uh, we have on today Amy Palachik uh, from Warren Pinnacle Consulting, who's going to be speaking about the application of the sea level affecting marshes model, SLAM, to New York and Connecticut. And before we get started, I want to let everyone know how to ask questions. There's two different ways to ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in your user interface. Um, and then we'll unmute you and you can ask your question directly to Amy. Um, or you can uh, type your question into the question panel of the user interface. Uh, during the presentation itself, um, if you just stick to typing questions in, uh, but during the question and answer, feel free to either raise your hand or uh, type your question in, and um, then we can relay that to Amy if you type it in. Okay. Well, great. I'll turn it over to you now, Amy. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thanks, Sarah. So um, today I'm going to talk about two recent projects we've completed for um, New York and Connecticut applying SLAM to the, the entire um, region there. And this was funded by the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, which funded um, Long Island, um, the New York City, Staten Island area, and up into the Hudson Estuary, and then the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission um, funded Westchester County and um, the um, Connecticut count, coastal counties uh, to create a seamless SLAM application to the entire area. And um, I'm going to talk briefly um, about the bullets on the left-hand side of the slide here, um, just give some background and some model setup basics, and then I'm really going to focus on um, the results section of of this um, slide here on the right hand side and go um, into some examples of the uncertainty setup and the uncertainty results, which are really the um, kind of really interesting portion of this particular study. Um, now the goals for um, both uh, NYSERDA and NUIPIC were to incorporate mechanistic accretion modeling into the SLAM applications and also to run the uncertainty analyses and ultimately derive um, numerical and map-based projections for the effects of sea level rise based on a couple of scenarios and then um, to use these to identify ultimately adaptation strategies to uh, cope with the effects of accelerated sea level rise. So just a little bit of background about SLAM. Um, I'll wait for my slide to catch up with me. Here we go. Um, SLAM is the sea level affecting marshes model, as Sarah mentioned. It simulates five dominant processes in wetland conversions under um, the pressure of accelerated sea level rise. These are inundation, erosion, accretion, soil saturation, and then barrier island overwash due to storms. And in fact, um, these last two, the soil saturation and barrier island overwash, we did not apply in this, these projects due to a lack of data. Um, but the first three are applied universally when SLAM is used. Uh, SLAM uh, uses six, 26 different types of land cover types um, and then uses a complex decision tree based on elevations within the tidal frame to um, represent the transfers between these land cover types and then ultimately provides numerical map-based output in the form of rasters and um, Excel tables and, and GIFs um, for maps as well. And um, the benefits of the model are, are several, but um, mainly the modest data requirements allow application to many sites at a very reasonable cost comparatively. And then the simulations also run quickly. And then in addition, SLAM has an integrated um, parameter sensitivity and stochastic uncertainty modules. And I have uncertainty there in, in red because as far as we know, this is the only sea level rise um, model of this kind that will incorporate um, in the model itself the uncertainty aspect under um, that particular mode of simulation. And the model has been used by several different entities and notably the Fish and Wildlife Service, we've run more than 100 um, coastal refuges for them. Now some um, important limitations of the model I want to go over just briefly. 
Um, it's not a hydrodynamic model. Uh, anthropogenic changes are not always included. Um, they, things like beach nourishment, shoreline armoring, levees, and tide gates, and construction of levees, that, that's an important distinction because um, levees are included in the model. Um, but these anthropogenic changes that may happen during the course of the simulation um, are not always included, but they can be added by the modeler depending on the scope. The model is flexible from that point of view. Um, and then we're really not looking at large storm effects, so um, the effects of overwash, again, could be undercounted. So we're really just focusing in on the effects of sea level rise. Taking a break here while my slide catches up with me. Um, so this is the New York and Connecticut study area. Uh, it covers the entire study, uh, in the entire coast of Connecticut, and then um, New York up to um, the Tappan Zee Bridge in um, the Hudson River. Uh, again, I'm faster than my slides here. Um, and we applied to this uh, study area four different sea level rise scenarios, and those were derived based on the NYSERDA climate document and then input from our, our PAC, our um, advisory committee. And so the four scenarios we looked at was a generalized climate minimum model, or I'm sorry, maximum model, uh, the one meter scenario, sea level rise scenario by 2100, the, a rapid ice melt minimum scenario, and a rapid ice melt maximum scenario. And these um, covered a large part of the um, range that is generally accepted to be the range of um, expected sea level rise also by IPCC and, and other science, climate scientists. And some other common data inputs were both studies. Um, both were um, covered with a five um, square meter cell size, so pretty high resolution for the SLAM models. And the model was applied to elevations below um, 5 meters and AVD 88. All the elevation data was hydro-enforced by Ground Point, our sub GIS subcontractor. Um, that was to ensure that the um, hydroconnectivity was um, correct through uh, underneath the bridges and, and, and things like that. Um, and also we used a similar tide range data and frequency of flooding data for both studies um, from the NOAA tide data. Um, and also um, for New York, we had some data from the Long Island Shore website, which was pretty useful. Now to focus in on the Connecticut data sources, um, we had bare earth elevation data um, through post-Sandy LIDAR data for the um, entire coastal fringe and then uh, some other LIDAR um, data sets to cover behind there. Um, then we had wetland layers um, exclusively from the National Wetland Inventory and then several um, dike and impoundment um, data sources. The impervious, which gives us our, our developed dry land footprint came from the National Land Cover data set and then uh, particular to the study we had a very detailed um, data set for erosion, um, coastal erosion in Connecticut from a recent um, study done um, out, of the, out of the Connecticut DEP. For New York the data sets were similar. Um, we had um, post-Sandy LIDAR coverage for most of the coast and um, a major difference between the two studies is we had a, a more of a, a mosaic of wetland layers, particularly in the New York City area, which really lent, and we worked closely with the um, experts there to really create a good wetland data layer for the initial condition in that area. Um, we had um, similar sources for dikes and impoundments, and then also uh, the impervious layer was a little bit different. We worked with the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab, who created a very detailed impervious layer to uh, come up with a, a, a almost 
um, you can almost see the houses here in, and driveways in the impervious layer um, in, for New York. And then we had very, uh, we had site specific erosion rates, but not quite as um, detailed as those for Connecticut. Next, I'll uh, go ahead and talk about the accretion modeling, which was also similar for both studies. Um, and we kind of have a bad habit here in our practice. We kind of interchangeably use accretion for the concept of marsh elevation change. Um, we do account for when we are talking about accretion, uh, quote unquote, we, for um, shallow subsidence that occurs um, in these marshes as well. So we're really looking at elevation change. Um, but in these applications, we were looking to account for these feedbacks between tidal marsh accretion rates and sea level rise because what's happening is as um, the marshes are subjected to increased inundation, they have the capability of additional deposition of inorganic sediment, which then allows wetlands to keep pace with the rise in sea levels. And so we investigated these relationships by looking for observed accretion rates or elevation change rates, and um, we obtained those through literature review um, and working closely with experts throughout the study area. And once we had those accretion rates and their like, precisely derived locations, we found that the elevation that they were taken at based on the um, DEM we were applying to the model, so the elevation layer applied. Um, we found that um, irregularly flooded or high marshes really did not have a strong relationship to elevation. However, um, regularly flooded marshes or low marshes did, and so we applied the feedbacks to those marshes. And in order for us to apply um, these mechanistic accretion models, we used the marsh equilibrium model of Jim Morris. And um, that provided us with some curves to represent this um, feedback relationship. And I'll just walk you through here the, this uppermost um, graphic. Here we're, we're at mean tide level um, on the x-axis and moving upward in the tidal frame towards mean, high, mean higher high water. So if we're looking at the top of the tidal frame here, we have um, lower accretion rates represented on the y-axis here um, at higher elevations because um, they're not subjected to quite as much inundation. Now as we go lower in the tidal frame, which will occur as a marsh also becomes more inundated due to sea level rise, the accretion rate goes up because it's exposed to more inundation. Then once you get to a certain point, as you can see here on this top line, um, it will start, the accretion rate will start to decrease because you're, it's, the marsh is now becoming waterlogged and unable to grow in such a um, waterlogged condition. Uh, so the differences in these curves that we're seeing um, were for the different portions of the study area, the way we broke up in particular in this graph, the New York study area, and those differences are based on, on tide ranges, mainly suspended sediment concentrations and um, the salinity, which is reflected in the biomass in the MEM model. So once we have our model set up, um, we subject it to a, a calibration step for, through what we call a time zero, in which we take the initial wetland coverage, the elevation data layer that's um, applied, and then the tide data that we're applying, and we bring those together and validate them uh, against the, the con um, SLAM conceptual model where we have the expected elevation ranges for um, each wetland type. And so um, we look at the time zero output map to determine where and how extensive um, our model calibrations need to be. And um, so we are, do things like adjust the tide in the water levels or um, potentially add dikes or culverts to um, allow movement of water or stop the water the, from arriving, and then um, potentially additional hydro enforcement, which is like adding additional culverts. Now, um, sometimes we do also change the, um, the, sl the SLAM conceptual model, but that's very rare. Um, and then we model um, our projections from the time zero, so when we're taking um, 
making numerical calculations um, for reporting, we are reporting those from time zero, so we're not including any um, model uh, artifacts in those calculations. And here in the next slide, I show a picture actually of what happens in the time zero. In fact, sometimes the wetland layer is improved by the time zero model calibration step. So in the top panel, you see a picture of a salt pan near Mastic, New York, that is um, represented in the SLAM model by an irregularly flooded marsh here in the orange that is not quite as um, cut up through ditching as the salt pan is in real life. But now when we apply um, the model expectations or the conceptual model in time zero, we find that there are, in fact, these ditches do come through based on the elevations in the DEM. And so it creates kind of a more realistic um, um, wetland layer than we've started out with. Now, as I mentioned, SLAM will provide rasters and tabular output for each um, time step run. And today, I'm really just going to focus in on maps. And so that would be the raster output. And I'm going to also home in on just two areas of the study area to look at kind of some representative results. Um, those areas will be Hewlett Bay in New York, here in the south of Long Island, and then the other area, Bridgeport in Connecticut. So this is a time zero map for Hewlett Bay. Wait for it to catch up with me here. There we go. And um, I'll walk you through the colors here so we can, um, so you're as familiar with the SLAM colors as, as we are here at Warren Pinnacle. Um, the orange is irregularly flooded marsh or high marsh. And the teal is regularly flooded marsh or low marsh. Um, the light red is developed, undeveloped dry land, pardon me, and then the darker red is the developed dry land. And then another important category that we'll be seeing crop up throughout the simulation time period is uh, the gray or tidal flat. So I'm just going to flip through some maps here of um, the results of each sea level rise scenario at 2100. So the first one we'll examine is the GCM max scenario in which we see that there is some loss of um, high marsh and conversion to low marsh. We see um, flooding of developed land which is represented by the purple. And then we also do see some marsh migration. So these areas that had started as dry land are starting to look um, like marsh under the, this amount of sea level rise. In, in um, geez, it's not 100 years, it's 85 years now. So um, the next scenario, the one meter of sea level rise by 2100, SLAM shows much um, more extensive change of the high marsh to low marsh, continued marsh migration inland, and more um, flooding of developed land. Under the rim min scenario at 2100, which is um, 1.3 meters of sea level rise by 2100. We're starting to have loss of also the low marsh and even more um, migration of marsh inland. And then under the Remax scenario where we're um, at almost 2 meters of sea level rise, 1.7 meters of sea level rise, we have quite a bit of loss of that marsh and um, we've converted almost exclusively to tidal flat in the majority of the previous marsh area. And it's really not looking good for the people that live here um, to the south of Hewlett Bay. Now, Hewlett Bay shows that there's capacity for marsh migration in certain areas and there's also um, extensive marsh loss overall. Um, here in Bridgeport, Connecticut, the, the um, 
outlook is a little bit different. So here we're um, again looking at the majority high marsh with some low marsh interspersed and a lot of development around not quite as much dry land um, for marshes to migrate to. So under the first um, scenario of sea level rise, the GCM max scenario, we see that the marshes are still holding on and we have quite a bit of inland flooding. Under the one meter scenario, still some high marsh hanging on. Um, the majority is now low marsh, though continued inland flooding. Sorry about the delay here, but um, almost there. Okay. Under the, the rim um, minimum scenario, the rapid ice melt minimum scenario, still um, marsh hanging on and also migrating into the um, available areas, but we've got just entirely flooded areas um, of development. And then finally, under the rim max scenario, we can see the, the difference here um, is from Hewlett Bay is in fact that um, there's still marsh hanging on as opposed to being um, tidal flat as we saw in that area. So zooming out for some um, bird's eye view observations of the entire study area um, for both Connecticut and New York, uh, we found um, 40 to 100 percent loss of, of high marsh throughout the study area depending on the sea level rise scenario. And these are offset by increases of transitional marsh, which is in fact um, the marsh type that is created when dry land is inundated. Um, not surprisingly, low marshes are predicted to increase because they're the marsh that takes over high marshes once they're inundated. Um, and then both high and low marsh appear to be decreasing in resilience from higher to lower tide range. That is, that areas that have higher tide ranges are more resilient to the effects of sea level rise, accelerated sea level rise than microtidal areas. And so we saw that occurring from um, west to east in the Long Island um, along the coast of Connecticut. And this is um, kind of in um, contradiction to the historical marsh loss rates that have been um, observed throughout that area, but it's important to remember that um, historically we've seen marsh loss due to mainly anthropogenic factors, excess nutrients, um, things other than accelerated sea level rise. So. Under the lower sea level rise scenarios, we saw that um, marshes can keep up with um, the accelerated sea level rise through the accretion rates with the feedbacks. Um, however, at higher sea level rise scenarios, we've noticed that in many areas this isn't, um, can, doesn't continue to be true. Um, and then one interesting point is that there are opportunities for marshes to migrate. So. Um, in the scenarios, Marco did a very interesting uh, quick calculation here. Up to about 43,000 acres of undeveloped dryland colonization occurred in the, in the maximum um, scenario, sea level rise scenario, as opposed to the 45,000 acres approximately occur currently occupied by tidal marsh. So um, if marshes were able to just migrate unstopped, they would be able to uh, accommodate um, about the same area, take up about the same area that they do um, today. However, we know that that would be a, not, that really wouldn't occur because they're limited by um, development. So um, the deterministic results that I've just presented here uh, can be very valuable for communication. The maps are really powerful. Um, 
when you show people these worst case, best case, most likely um, scenarios, they're um, very helpful, but we're not considering any of the in-between possibilities. And um, we're not accounting for the probability of these things to happen. We're not able to put confidence intervals on these results. And um, more importantly, you have to decide which case you're going to use for planning. Are you going to plan for the worst case or the best case or the most likely? And then you have to defend that against the people that might not agree with you. So um, this is where what brings us to the stochastic uncertainty and the value of this. So the uncertainty analysis accounts for uncertainty in all of the input data that we're putting into the model, um, but also, and most importantly, in future sea level rise, since that is our most uncertain variable. We just don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so we're considering many possible scenarios when we run models in this, in this mode. Um, it takes a, a random selection of inputs from the probability distributions that we assign, and I'll show you that in the next slide. And then we run the model hundreds of times and then aggregate those simulations, and that way we can present res the results not only um, on what may happen, but on how likely it is to occur. And so when we set up the model in this way, we are able to apply uncertainty not only to spatial data layers like the digital elevation layer or the um, datum correction layer, and we do that through a, um, applying the root mean squared error of the input data uh, and incorporating spatial autocorrelation. So this kind of colored um, map here actually this represents the uncertainty map that is applied to that layer, one, a new one for each um, simulation run. And then we also um, have a way to apply um, uncertainty distributions to each of our um, point estimate inputs. And so we can apply different distribution types based on um, the data that we're using or the, uh, or I'm sorry, or the uh, um, or a professional judgment to represent those um, uncertainty distributions. And as I said before, we can represent sea level rise, the uncertainty of the sea level rise. So this shows the um, distribution of sea level rise that we have applied in these simulations. So from here on out, when I'm showing you the data, I won't be um, based on one scenario, but including the uncertainty of future sea level rise. And that most likely data point is around 1 meter by 2100. And it is um, less likely that it could be less than that down to um, about 35 centimeters by 2100. That would be great. Um, but it could be um, also more likely that it's more up to 2 and a half meters, a little less. So when we run the uncertainty module, um, after the days of data collection, we can make uh, tables of results. We can provide time series for each type of um, wetland type based on uh, and present the confidence intervals that way. We can show histograms at time steps for each type of a wetland, and we can um, show percent likelihood maps, which is what I'm going to focus in on today. Sorry about the delay here. So here I'm showing the probability of land to open water by 2100 for the entire New York and Connecticut study area. And these uncertainties are probabilities um, ranging from 0 to 100% probable, so from cold to hot on this um, blue to red scale. So um, our hotspots are going to be the places that are 100% or pro more, most probable, and cold is less but still probable. And um, so for the majority of the study area, we ran about 200 simulations. Um, and the, this would mean so that if, if something is 50% probable, in 50% of the simulations, that parcel, um, that cell was land and 2100, and in 50% um, it was open water, um, but they all started as land, um, to be land to open water. 
So we can see that there are some areas that are not likely to lose any land, so, but there are other areas like here in the Connecticut River estuary or in the um, southern part of Long Island that are, are quite likely to actually lose land to open water by 2100. And some of that's here in kind of our Hewlett Bay area, so we'll go back and focus in on that. So here I'm just showing in the next slide um, a recap of the time zero. of the Hewlett Bay that we, we looked at a few slides ago. And some of the areas that I'm going to, we're going to focus in on in these probability um, maps are, are going to be these existing dry land areas where marshes could migrate in the future. So on this next slide, we're looking at the percent likelihood of coastal marsh. And we can see that it's very hot here in the area of where coastal marshes already exist. So, um, so that's good that our marshes will persist for tw to, uh, through 2025 and they have a very high likelihood of still being there. But we're also seeing that we're starting to have a probability that we're going to have marsh in, this, um, in these dry land areas by, by 2025. By 2055, we're starting to see that that probability is not only increasing, it, it's also spreading inwards and um, into many people's backyards, unfortunately, for these neighborhoods. By 2085, in fact, we're starting to um, cool down our, our marshes in our previously high marsh area. So it's becoming less likely that these areas are high marsh, but we're heating up in the areas where the marsh migration could be occurring. And then by 2100, we are um, down near 60-50% for um, marsh still existing in our previous marsh areas, but um, up in the maybe 80 or 90% or that we are going to have marsh um, where our previous dry land was and in lots of people's backyards, unfortunately. So this is very interesting because it will can allow you to um, look at marsh migration not only locationally but with a probability um, to provide for planning and, and management and um, land acquisition. Now before we also looked at Hewlett Bay and it looks pretty bad for some of the people living to the south of the bay and when you show these maps people always want to see wh where their house is and that's what they're interested in. I, we can say that we're always interested in the marsh but you know a taxpayer in, in, in your study area really just wants to see where their house is and don't you want to see where your house is too? That's pretty, I, I mean I'm always interested. Um, but when you see that it gets flooded, you say, meh, this is just a model. But, you know, when then you have these percent likelihood maps, you can see that um, it's pretty likely that down here by 2100, there is going to need to be some assessment of how people are going to live in this area that is, has a 100% chance of being flooded by that time. So just to recap a little bit about our um, stochastic uncertainty modeling, it quantifies the likelihood of marsh bait not only where it will be, but where it probably won't be. And it also um, quantifies the risk of land inundation and gives you short and long-term confidence in the projections. And so then the decisions based on these results can be more robust to criticism as compared to the deterministic results because now you no longer need to choose a worst or best case planning approach. You can incorporate the uncertainty of future sea level rise into your decision making process. 
And you can do a lot of additional data analyses with this kind of an um, output. So you can uh, create a decision-making support or support tools where you combine land valuation with these uncertainty results and kind of integrate the land value over time based on the probability of losses. You can focus in on um, ecological changes where you might have dry land to marsh or marsh to open water. Um, you can look at and analyze the diversity and fragmentation of wetlands to then look at um, the issues of um, focal species, which you can do also with the deterministic results, but this includes also a probability. Um, and then you can investigate robustly the marsh migration pathways, and you can look at that both from um, what the initial land cover type was or from a probability standpoint. And I'm going to go through an example of that in these next few slides. So here we're again looking at Hewlett Bay, but now we're looking at the probability of um, coastal, new coastal marsh, not the probability of just marsh, but we're looking about at the probability of where um, was a previously not coastal marsh and it will become in the future either high marsh, low marsh, transitional marsh, or uh, tidal fresh marsh, which is included, but it, it is not likely to occur in these simulations the way they were set up. In any case, here we're seeing that by 2025, it's cool, it's lower in the probability range, but it has the chance of becoming um, marsh in some particular areas. And then as we move into the future, in 2025, I'm sorry, 2055, we see that we have a the probability increasing in some of our previously probable areas and also it's growing, the probability is growing inland. And then by 2100, we see that there are several hot spots that have developed in these previously um, probable areas, but now it's, it's very likely based on the simulations that um, or run through SLAM that these areas will become coastal marsh by 2100. Now there are a lot of additional SLAM analyses that can enhance these types of um, this base analysis that we've run for um, New York and Connecticut. Um, We've run these simulations without including um, roads and infrastructure because when we use the bare earth LIDAR, those um, things are removed by the definition of the type of LIDAR that, there are, that we're using. Um, uh, so we're not incorporating the idea that those can become barriers to um, marsh migration and that presents kind of a best case marsh migration um, analysis. But in order to get a sense of also how those things are barriers, incorporating them into future analyses is important. Um, also, something that you can do with SLAM that I think is really a huge benefit of this model is that once you have the base model set up, it's a very economical way to examine some interventions and how those might play out into the future under accelerated sea level rise. So if you change the hydraulic connectivity, for example, by adding a culvert to allow um, tide water to reach into dry land areas and allow flo mitigate flooding in certain areas or with the idea of mitigating the flooding and allowing marshes to migrate in a controlled way, you can see what that would how that would work into the future. Um, you can also look at enhanced deposition if you have dredge spoil that you want to put on um, existing marshes. You can see um, or examine some different types of accretion rates that you would be mimicking through that deposition and how those would play out based on different sea level rise scenarios or through the uncertainty analysis. You can um, run that as well. And also beach nourishment, there is a, um, a <clears throat> not very widely used yet um, module of SLAM to incorporate beach nourishment um, through, throughout um, the future scenarios so that you can look at what effects that might have. 
So I've briefly gone over um, the multitude of data that came out of these studies just to provide some examples and um, the reports and in, in fact the input data, all of the outputs and ask your answers both for deterministic and the uncertainty maps are available on our website and we have um, two different dedicated websites, one for the LIS study um, which is the Connecticut study and then the other for the New York NYSERDA study um, through the two different links here. Um, and then the New York results eventually will be posted to SlamView where um, you can analyze those data on your own through that web GIS portal. Um, and then <clears throat> if you have any questions about SLAM or these particular projects, we're happy to answer them now or any time in the future. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and I'm going to promote Jonathan now to a panelist, so hopefully he'll be able to speak as well. Okay. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, again, you can send questions in through the question panel of the user interface, or you can raise your virtual hand to be unmuted. And I'll just actually check and see if there's anyone there in that situation. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, several questions already. Uh, let's see. Is one is SLAM used in planning for coastal change in other states? Oh, definitely. We just actually finished a project where we applied SLAM to the entire um, Gulf Coast of the United States. So there is a seamless SLAM model that exists um, for for the Gulf Coast. There was a lot that was already applied on Southeast Louisiana, Galveston Bay, several parts of Florida all of the fish and wildlife refuges, um, they've all been modeled. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the East Coast has been modeled, the entire coast of Oregon, so it is widely used. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, let's see, another question. Um, how is this project similar to and different from the Nature Conservancy sea level rise modeling along the Connecticut coast? That's a, a good question. So the um, Nature Conservancy, uh, I'm assuming this question is in regards to the Coastal Resiliency Viewer that's available online. Yes, I think so. Uh, so, yeah. No, it's just, sorry, yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Yes. And there was okay. a, a second comment about, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, it, it's okay, go ahead. Uh, there was also a comment that uh, uh, the New York CERTA results have also been incorporated into the Nature Conservancy's Coastal Resilience Tool. Uh. That's right. So there are SLAM results um, in the Coastal Resilience Tool, not only in New York, but in, in a couple different other areas. Um, the difference is um, with their inundation viewer uses um, kind of like a, a high, medium, and low accretion rate and that's kind of blanket applied to the area that you're looking at and then and it's not quite as site specific as what we're doing here where we've um, contacted local experts, we're running this accretion feedback model. Um, and definitely the uncertainty aspect is, is novel compared to what the Nature Conservancy has online. Okay, thank you. Um, is, uh, Jonathan chiming in. I, I just, um, Amy answered that first question very well. I just wanted to point out in terms of actually planning, um, we went, I recently went to a conference of all the New England states um, and um, every New England state uh, except for Maine is um, using SLAM as part of their planning. And, um, and uh, Rhode Island is really um, doing an excellent job in terms of outreach, uh, although, um, and, and they've done that all on their own using the open source plan model. So it is, uh, it's widely used in the, in the planning realm as well as just the study realm. It's becoming that way anyway. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, should we move on to the next question? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, there was a question that came in er, uh, early on during the presentation, um, but how, how is the migration rate for marshes calculated? Well, it's basically we're looking at the elevation of the land um, and then the tide ranges um, and then the sea level rise 
that kind of that moves the land down and continues to apply that tide range um, onto the new moved down land area. Um, and maybe Jonathan, you can explain it a little bit better than that. Um, but it's just using the SLAM conceptual model for where in the, the tidal frame wetlands should be, and then when the land moves down relative to the mean tide level or the mean sea level, which is the zero datum in SLAM, that new tide range is now defining where the new marshes are. Yeah, I think that's very well explained. I mean, the only thing to add to that is that the, um, we, we don't have restrictions on the speed at which uh, marsh can migrate. So, in, in some cases, maybe uh, the, the results are overly optimistic, and if there if there's a very high rate of sea level rise, uh, perhaps marshes won't be able to uh, propagate as rapidly as we're suggesting. But um, so there is some uncertainty with respect to newly flooded lands, both in terms of um, whether that land is going to be available for marsh migration, and also um, with respect to whether the marsh will even have time to to migrate there. Or, or the capability. Okay, thank you guys. Um, let's see, next question. Do you have uncertainty maps for New York City that you can share? Yes, they're on um, the website, the warrenpinnacle.com, prof slam nicerta. Okay, and um, some more question, but different area. Uh, where would I go to get the SLAM results for the seamless Gulf of Mexico analysis? Uh, those are on our website as well. Um, they're kind of hidden, but we can add um, the links to that um, today, I think, Jonathan. There's no problem yeah, with that. Yeah, right? we're still going through our, our, our final. We're not quite finished with the final reporting on that, so I'm not. Sh I, I would. It. I mean, we really are in the final throws here. Yeah, that's true. Um, but we. But I. I don't know. We are uh, making modifications to the project documents. So we'd have to just talk with the um, technical team and make sure that they will. I, I think on an individual basis, we can certainly um, release that information and. Um, and it's, uh, but I think within the month we should have the whole thing um, ready to roll out, and then we'll have that on our website on the on the SLAM webpage. Right, and also um, those results will be on SLAM View eventually as well, sooner rather than later, I think. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of good questions. It's hard to pick. Um, let's see. Have you tried running any storm surge scenarios on top of the SLAM output for these areas? We have not because that was not in the scope of this work, but we would be happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, it, it's inter and it's inter it has right. It has been done um, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there, it's been done for Galveston. We're currently doing that um, for the eastern shore of Virginia. So it, it is a it is a common linkage of models, but um, it right, hasn't been done in this study area yet. Well answered, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, another question, how does the model pr determine protective capacity? Does it account for the value of what is being protected? Well, that is an excellent question, and that's in fact why that's kind of under the additional analyses, because that w we would use SLAM as a data layer within that decision-making process to determine the, def the protective capacity along with um, other uh, other aspects of the input data in the area that you're examining. So it doesn't really come right out of SLAM. It, you have to do a little bit of additional analysis for that, but it is possible. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy. And let's see, um, how accessible is the SLAM model to institutions and researchers who want to use the tool? It's completely open source, and you can download it from our website. And there's a SLAM forum where you can go to um, look at the previously asked questions for people that are new to using SLAM and getting started. And you can also submit questions, which we answer um, generally and within a, a couple of day to a couple of days in order to allow all users to be successful with the model. Okay, great. Thank you. And Another question. You noted the model is not hydrodynamic. Can you explain what that means? 
So we are, are not looking on um, a cell-by-cell -cell basis at the water flows that are uh, occurring um, on a time step basis. Uh, we are looking at, we are basically using the conceptual model of where um, wetlands occur within the tidal frame to define how the model works. So um, tide ranges aren't dynamic throughout the, the study area. We, we, I mean, tide ranges can vary throughout the study area based on inputting subsites, but they don't change into the future. Okay, um, great. And then another question, where do you get the suspended sediment data for accretion modeling? We use the EPA Store It website um, where you can go and through some brute force get, some, get the um, suspended sediment data from, from their historical data records. Okay. Um, and there was a question as to whether the slides uh, will be available. And I just wanted to let everyone know that they will. Both the recording of this uh, presentation as well as the slides will be made available on openchannels.org. And if uh, you want me to send you a note when everything's available, you can uh, just send me an email at sarah underscore car at natureserve.org and I'll, I'll notify you when everything's available online. Okay. And do you have a timetable for the work on the eastern shore of Virginia, and is there any work being done on the Chesapeake Bay? Um, I'm not sure of the timetable for, I, I know our internal timetable for passing those results on to the next group of modelers because it's actually a, a cascade of models that will be applied in the area that we're studying currently. Um, I don't know when we might be able to provide those to um, the general public. And um, we are looking at the Chesapeake Bay, but just um, the bay sides of Accomack and Northampton counties, nothing um, into Maryland or the, um, it, the other side of Virginia. OK. Um, now this question, I'm, I'm having a little trouble parsing, but I think, I, did you run the stochastic uncertainty analysis using SLAM results um, with a protect developed dry lands option? No, we did not. Okay. Yeah, what we did was, was a little bit different in this simulation was that we, um, we look at, um, we have a separate category which is called flooded um, dry lands and uh, Flooded developed. Sorry, flooded developed. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and, um, and and so what we do is uh, account for we, we do not allow marshes to inhabit those lands, but we account for which and what developed lands are, are subject to regular flooding. Um, and so to a certain extent, it's kind of similar to letting the protected be left on because we are not allowing marshes to inhabit what is what is considered to be developed. Um, but uh, but it's, it's just a slightly different nuance. It also provides a little more information than that other study does in terms of where the flooding is going to occur in terms of infrastructure. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see. Is it assumed that fresh brackish marsh converts to salt mar marsh, or are there provisions that fresh brackish marsh will convert directly to open water? It's generally assumed that it will convert into, uh, I mean, what we kind of separated out into, we follow um, a lot the National Wetlands Inventory, as that's been our primary wetlands data set, although it's been supplemented by a lot of, of uh, state um, and local updates as well. But, um, and in terms of that, they look, they, they consider it to be like, um, it's irregularly flooded and a regularly flooded marsh, which we often refer to as a low marsh and a high marsh for clarity. So we do, uh, so if you have a, a, um, a brackish or a fresh uh, marsh um, that usually falls into the irregularly flooded and high category, uh, NWI also has a tidal fresh marsh, which is subject to a different decision tree. But if we assume we're just talking about a high marsh, that does convert to a low marsh, into a saline marsh uh, prior to uh, further on, and it would convert to a, a tidal flat um, if, if uh, sea level rise was significant enough. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. 
Um, let's see, another one. You mentioned tide ranges. What water level did you use for your analysis? Was it mean high tide? Uh, the datum for SLAM is um, mean tide level. And um, so we in, input our tide ranges as the great, great diurnal tide range. And we assume the tide range to be um, symmetrical. And map okay. outputs show results at mean low or low water um, to the extent that we can. National Wetlands Inventory data is not um, tidally coordinated, so it's not always perfect. But that's what the model projections show, it's the mean low or low water, uh, what it would look like. Okay. And we just have one more question, so if uh, anybody else had an additional question they wanted to send in, go ahead and send it now. Um, last question for right now. Um, I assume that you did not run SLAM for the whole study area at one time. How did you divide the SLAM analysis area? If you have divided the study area for analysis while presenting it in the SLAM view website, how are you going to take care of the edge, edge effect? Well, um, we ran actually, that's a great question. Um, the New York NYSERDA study area was divided into five different parts. Um, Connecticut was divided um, into three study areas, um, and SLAM can output ra rasters uh, um, of, that are separated. So you can have an input that in, defines the output raster areas, and um, so Connecticut was broken up into several different rasters in order for us to report the data both on a county level and a watershed level. Um, and um, New York was broken up mainly by county and then New York City and, and the Hudson River area and each of those had buffers. Um, so we ran a little bit of overlap between them but then that overlap area was cut out um, in the output rasters. Um, in order to have a seamless application. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And so we don't, we haven't had any more questions uh, come in, so we'll wrap up. But uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you so much, and and Jonathan and Marco. Thank you also for being uh, helping out with uh, questions about detailed questions about the model. Um, this is a great presentation, Amy, and we very much appreciate you doing it. And um, I'm sure and everyone should uh, feel free to contact Amy afterwards if you have any additional follow-up. Thank you very much to the EBM Tools Network and the Open Channels for hosting this. It's, um, we're really glad to have this outlet to um, let people know about the current work and the status of the model. And again, like Sarah said, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any additional questions or um, are interested in running SLAM in a new, new part of the country or in a new way. Okay. Thanks, Amy. And and uh, we just had uh, several people express their thanks, too, into the question panel. So, All right. Thanks again, and I hope all okay. of you can join us for a future webinar. Okay. Bye, everyone.